the young, raw recruits of 924 Troop. Training to be Royal Marine Commandos and just 20 weeks away from the front line in Afghanistan. Who's it going to be? Get up! Get down, guys! Get down! But the troop have already lost 25 recruits and are struggling as individuals and as a team to cope with the heavy demands. Tonight, I join them as they're taught how to survive behind enemy lines. Getting captured is not fucking an option. The people we fight are not interested in taking prisoners. If you get caught, you are fucking going to die. Keep striking all the way down. And I watch as they get to kill for the first time. All right, he's ready to go. Soldiers, you should relish the chance of getting wet. Go on, right down, right down. Don't be shy. Bring a little bit of water. For the recruits of 924 Troop, training is getting harder and harder. The minute, fellas, you're only wet. The luckiest, the middle of the summer. When you're doing your final exercise in January, you're going to be cold and wet. They are being extended in ways they could never have imagined. If it's not wading through ice cold ponds up to their necks, it's breathing noxious CS gas in chemical warfare training. Not something you would do just for the hell of it. Fucking <coughs> hell. <coughs> At first, you don't feel sort of like too bad, and half, halfway through saying what you've got to say, all of a sudden it just hits you and your eyes start watering, and uh, uh, it shows you that these actually do work. You're wandering around and they're just breathing normal with your gas mask on. As soon as you take it off, it's just like straight onto your face. It wasn't too bad, like I've, I've heard most people say it, but it was still hard. <laughs> you could feel yourself choking. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. It's not too bad. You know what I mean? I don't know why they got to do that to you. There's a lot of things bad for you, like getting shot, but they don't shoot you, do they? No. <laughs> the training is getting more advanced, but the recruits are still struggling with the basics like working together and timekeeping. Right, fellas, you were late twice yesterday for my instructors. Not once, but twice, OK? You are letting the standards slip in terms of being there on time. We do not have time in the second phase of training to be chasing you up for being late, OK? When we tell you to be somewhere, you are there five minutes before and you are ready to go with all your kit and equipment. We're now going to conduct some quick changes in order that you get used to and are reminded that you can get ready in two or three minutes when we tell you to. When I say go, you have to parade outside in immaculate fizz kit, ready for bottom field. You have three minutes. Go! Hurry up! Go to the stairs, man! We don't have to be fucking the trip! No doubt the recruits would much rather be abseiling down cliffs with daggers between their teeth. But before they can do that sort of thing, they have to show they can obey orders and do so double quick. Lieutenant Orlando Rogers, the troop commander, is now a robust disciplinarian. But that wasn't always the case. Well, crikey. Before I joined the Royal Marines, I was, what in life I was a reprobate. I was um, a bit of a problem child, um, far too much energy, too hyperactive, and um, needed something to channel my energy. Ended up running away from home a couple of times, um, ended up in foster care, and then one time on Dartmoor, but if I know this is a good one, I uh, wasn't allowed to go horse riding, so I ran away from my mum across Dartmoor, um, hid behind a rock. National Park wardens came to look for me, police came to look for me, and then all of a sudden, as I was camouflaged behind this rock, a police helicopter came over the horizon and uh, started hunting for me. I ran away on Dartmoor, and uh, that was me in foster care and off to boarding school. You people have now got two minutes 
get inside. I am Efrig. Do not touch me or the fucking troop commander. Go! And then my social worker said, right, you need to do something with your life. You know, start doing something. So uh, I started doing judo and then joined the Royal Marine Reserves when I was 16 years old, as early as I could, and then joined the Marines straight after that. So it's been a focus, really, for my energy. And I think too often people dismiss problem children as going nowhere and doing nothing with their lives, and I think in my case it's probably just misdirected energy and, yeah, a few problems. But no, it's good now. All good. It's all come good. As you have probably gathered now, it is quite a simple equation. If you are there on time, you join the winner's enclosure. If you are not, you do not. We now have, when I say go, three minutes to get into the immaculate drill rig. Go! Hurry up! Quick changes as a punishment are, of course, a double whammy. Not only do the recruits have to do the changes, the slowest getting press-ups for their pains, but tonight they'll all have to re-iron everything they've put on. Do not let it slip again further on in training, or you'll be doing this every lunchtime. Do you understand? Yes, sir! OK, fellas, that is that serial over. What I want now is everyone on the landing. Go! Do not touch me, Williams. Though they don't know it, some of the recruits are already earmarked for a troop commander's warning, the first step towards being kicked out of the troop. So just as the training is stepping up, some of the recruits could be in for the big fall. As the training steps up, there's less and less room for failure, especially in things like fast roping. Royal Marine Commandos are invariably the first troops on the ground in any conflict. Often they will land by sea, at other times from the air. They use this um, all the time on, on live operations in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, just to get as many troops on the ground as quickly as possible. If you think um, two helicopters or two ropes, one either side with two dispatches or something like that, you can get pretty much a troop out in uh, under a minute or so, which is uh, pretty good going. The body around the left, right? Okay, away you go. Fast roping is an individual skill, but it has to be done as a team. Technique is crucial, and timing, split second. That's the way I want everyone to go. The faster a troop is down, the greater the likelihood of overcoming the enemy. Okay, guys, you need to make sure you've got that speed so that you don't end up getting the old muzzle in the face. For fast roping, as for all aspects of practical combat, the success of the group depends on everyone working together. If one fails, all will. And in training, if one person consistently falls short of standards, he'll find himself on official warning. OK, recruit hunt. Sir, I am PO 6494544 Kilo Recruit Hunt 9242. OK, recruit hunt. Right, you know why you're here. I spoke to you um, last week about your troop commander's warning, OK, Sir. for integrity. This recruit had insisted he'd washed one morning, but his bone-dry flannel told another story. Let me read out my troop commander's warning to you. Recruit Hunt, the main problem I have with your flannel incident is your blatant, unquestionable lying. Making a mistake is human, having the balls to own up to it, however, is decency and basic integrity. You must understand in the nature of your chosen career, honesty is vital. Also, Recruit Hunt, remember, the, tre the team have been through training as well. Stop trying to bullshit us. If you fucked up, like I've told you time and time before, you stick your hand up, you take it on the chin like a fucking man. Lying to the team is not what we require. Come and sign here, Recruit Hunt. If you rectify those things, you'll be taken off Troop Commander's warning and nothing more will be said, OK? At one time or another, most recruits will find themselves on warning. Integrity, or the lack of it, is one reason. But another is failure to keep your kit up to scratch or your weapons in working order. Seems you haven't passed one of these inspections yet, Wilshire, I suggest you put more time and effort in. Otherwise, you're not destined to be a Royal Marines commander. OK, Recruit Williamson, you are on my warning for exceptionally poor admin, with a rusty weapon, brackets very, on your flash eliminator. OK, failure to do your admin again in such a manner will probably result in you being charged, OK? Having a rusty weapon, to the extent that yours was, is a chargeable offence. Further on in training, if that was on final exercise, I've known recruits get charged 60, 100, 200 pounds for having a weapon that rusty, OK? Yes, sir. And also answering back to one of my instructors, I was stood there and it was more than questioning the detail because you're unsure of it. There's a slight hint of attitude 
and the recruits around you were sighing in a kind of, ooh, that's going to be painful type of way, okay? Anything else for me, Recruit Williamson? No, sir. Williamson, um, you're going to be on warning um, for two months. We're not going to fucking pick on you for the rest of the training. Uh, we're not going to be watching you for the rest of the training. If you fix these points, you'll be off Troop Commander's warning. Yes, okay, sir. happy with that? Yes, sir. Ball's in your court, that's all you have to do. What's highlighted here? Okay, out you go. Thanks, Luke. Copy, off, salute. Thank you. Out turn. There you go. Official warnings. Recruits live in fear of them. You want to see Smith? So, yeah. An irresistible temptation for the training team to have a bit of fun sometimes. Get him in. Not shaved. Scott, is he shaved today? Because I told him to stop shaving. Because he's got a mate having a tiger on the screen. Down. Lee Smith is one of the strongest recruits in the troop and has never put a foot wrong. He currently has a rash and been given permission not to shave. Something Orlando Rogers is now conveniently going to forget. Yeah, so he's a good lad, so you can get him on a bit of a wind up and all take him good team. Salute, report to Commander. So I'm PO 61969 Juliet, recruit Smith of 1940. Hey, recruit Smith, shut the door. Why do you think you're here, Recruit Smith? Um, no idea, sir. So. Right, Recruit Smith, I'll give you a fucking clue. Everyone else outside is on Troop Commander's warning, so why do you think you're here? Because I'm on Troop Commander's warning, sir. Right, your admin this week, Recruit Smith, has been not up to standard, OK? Right. Numerous weapon drills, and finally, which has finished it off for me this week, is the fact that you've unshaven today, OK, Recruit Smith? Right. You know the morning routine, you know the standard required at the Commander Training Centre, right. and you've failed to do that, OK? As a result, you're going to be on Troop Commander's warning for one month. Recruit Smith, this isn't the end of the world. I'm just a bit pissed off with your attitude at the minute. Happy? Sir. Team, anything? Good <laughs> 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 effort for taking it in. Yeah. I'd like to see that. No gobbing off, was yeah, there no. at all? No, I'll, I'll take it, OK? Goes up a notch in my book, that now. That's all, Chris Smith, you've done well this week. Sure. And the reason we did that on you was because we knew you could fucking take it. Yeah. Don't bang me out, mate. Yeah. So, OK, away you go, Chris oh, Smith. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that was cruel. I'm not going to be able to sleep it tonight. Well. I missed it. <laughs> Mate, look, I'm still fucking shaking. Honestly, I thought to myself, what on earth have I done? What did he say, He just said to me, he said, like, your weapon drill is shit. He went, um, you haven't fucking shaved yesterday or today. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm looking, I thought to myself, I swear I can see, I didn't look anywhere, but out of the corner of my eye, I could see one of the corporals. And I thought, he surely he has got to have told him why I didn't shave. Yeah? Because I've got a rash, I've got some, I don't know what it is in his spread. So I'm like, I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> and I'm just shitting myself. No, the more he went on, the more I started to shake. And then uh, he just went, anything uh, from the corporals? And he just looked at them and they all started laughing. They thought it was fucking hilarious. Nearly. Life's a bitch, eh? That's it. Then you marry one, then you die. Exactly. <laughs> Royal Marines Association. Ex-Royal Marines and proud recipients of the Green Beret are meeting at the Commando Training Base to celebrate their Diamond Jubilee. The recruits of 924 Troop have come along to meet men who years back would have done much the same training as they've started to do themselves. Billy. Hey, hey, we're on telly here. Yes, we're on telly. And humming. And humming. And humming. Thank you, Billy and Terry. The Royal Marines Association, now 14,000 strong, was established in 1946 to help Royal Marines resettle and find jobs after the Second World War and allow them to maintain contact with the Corps on the principle that once a Marine, always a Marine. What, how did, what happened to you? Uh, whilst we were in, uh, the, in Aden, I was shot in the worried up cell, in the left leg and also the right leg, and lost the left leg. 
and uh, since then I've had lots of problems with it, but I'm still alive. Yeah. yeah. My father was 47 commando during the war, and my granddad was uh, a Royal Marine. And now they're starting the parade again. <laughs> <laughs> See how fast that was? Tell them this of us, and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. You could be lucky. You could go right the way through your services and do 22 years and come out the other end with not a thing wrong with you. Or the other side of the coin could come out like me. I was shot in both legs in, in a place called the Dupsan. You've heard of Bin Laden? It was against this mob. My uh, oppo, Scouts Wilson, he was a radio operator. He got killed immediately. Then they went for me. Shot me, both legs. Because when I got shot, I didn't move. I laid still. If I moved, exactly. Gunshot wound to the right knee, shrapnel wounds to both arms, because the incoming. But I laid still. It made me more stronger to go through life. I'm 62 year old. I've been a public member 25 years with my wife, Christine. I've been a stuntman for motion pictures. So I've had a goal, and the Royal Marines give me this incentive to go through life. Don't look at yourselves now. Look at yourselves when you've done all the training, all the yomping, all the night firing. It's all to come for you. You'll get strong, you'll get fit, you'll get brave. Why don't you look at the Royal Marine Commandos? Because you're a new family. <laughs> it's a big family. It goes on forever. Even when you die, you're still remembered. They're all in the drill shed. If I want to see my mate's name, I go, I go on, in the church. I go and look at his... Everybody, if it dies, gets killed in action. You know, so you're not forgotten. So the big family now is, is not your family at home, or by all means think of your family at home like I did, but think of the bigger family. The bigger picture now is the Royal Marine Commandos. I just listen to the stories all day long. Absolutely brilliant. You know, like, we've all been, well, we're going through it now, we've all been through it. It's um, ages and ages and a factor, is it, in the uh, Royal Marines? Race, age, religion, it all just goes out the window. It's all about, you know, being a wrong marine. It doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter who you are. I love it, I love it. I feel, I feel like I've really, really found something here, you know? Something I, something I really, really enjoy, you know, really have settled down. And I'll be happy when I go to a unit, and I'll be happy coming back here in, you know, 50 years' time when I'm like this, you know? God, yeah, it's like what the guy was saying down there about it all being a big family. It's just incredible, like, and so inspirational meeting them and hearing the stories and stuff. It really motivated all of us, like, just talking to them. It's just incredible, yeah, just to think, like, just all the hard times and stuff that you go through and just to think what they've done it just puts things into perspective a little bit. It makes us want to crack on with training. <laughs> Word of the week, fellas, debauchery, what does that mean? This. <laughs> Pomegranate, what does it mean? I've got a Okay, debauchery is excessive sensual indulgement. That's what that means, fellas. It's what all I expect you to be doing over this leave. It's a long weekend, and the recruits, after another week of gruelling training and punishments, are looking forward to a couple of days at home. You probably haven't realised it, but you've changed as individuals. You'll go home, you'll get pissed off when your family can't iron to the same standard you can. <laughs> when your brothers and sisters don't clear their plates after you, when your civvy mates do things that you think is particularly dropping and particularly civvy like, okay? Oh, oh, oh. dirty gecko bastards. <laughs> oh, and so close to freedom. But a recruit has left his mobile on. A price will have to be paid. The dreaded gecko bastards. 30 of them. And no one will be allowed out of the gates until he's finished every last one of them. For 924 Troop, Monday will come round all too fast. And it'll be the start of the hardest, most gruelling week of their training so far, and one that will push the recruits to their limits in ways none of them could even begin to imagine. Thank God that's over. <laughs> Three. 
924 troop back from home leave and the associated comforts are about to be dropped in the middle of Dartmoor for an entire week. Living rough, they'll be deprived of sleep, food and warmth and pushed to the limits of their endurance. But at least they're getting a ride out there. Flying in a helicopter to get me, lovely. Lovely, what more can you ask for? Yeah, this should be really good fun. <laughs> Better than going in a coach. Um, both got their advantages. Coach means you can get an hour's sleep. <laughs> and we're not going to get much sleep, are we? <laughs> OK, fellas, listen in. The Darmo is quite a harsh environment to operate in. You start to see the signs of hypothermia, <laughs> numbness, dizziness, lethargy in your friends, pale, clammy skin. Um, notify one of the members of the training team. But, fellas, that's why we fucking train you there, isn't it? So you can have a get on Darmore in the pissing rain in the middle of the night, then fuck me, you can pretty much do it anywhere. The system we employ in the Marines is called the buddy-buddy system. My buddy and I'm his buddy. You've got to look after them, be it in operations or be it in a pub brawl. You know, you've always got to be thinking about your oppo because when it gets more serious and you're in operations, constantly in the forefront of your mind is, where is my buddy? He's been there for me through thick and thin and now he will look after me. I think that's why People are so much closer in the forces, you know, like a brother almost, because you entrust people with your lives, and that's what you've got to do. You've got to trust people so much that you'll do anything for them, likewise they'll do anything for you, especially when the shit hits the fan and you're getting shot at. In Afghanistan, another Royal Marine was killed this week. That's 20 who've died in the fighting in Helmand this year. So is NATO making any progress? Afghanistan is to come. Right now, though, it's the wilds of Dartmoor, some of the most treacherous and inhospitable terrain in the British Isles. Right, this place is going to be quick. Myself, Corporal Glanfield, we've got burdens on, so there's no reason why you guys shouldn't be able to keep up with us. <laughs> Happy? Ecstatic, they say. Right, it's a single file, keep the spacing five to ten metres apart and keep up. For three days, they practice navigation skills, taking it in turns to either read the bearings or to count every step in order to measure the distance they've travelled. Check pace, or how far have we done? 700 metres. Change over now, then. If they don't start working as a team, they're going to find the days ahead very, very tough indeed. Hey, Hey, enjoying this? Lovely scene. <laughs> Can't say about my shoulders, but lovely scene. <laughs> What the recruits are learning here on Dartmoor could very well save their lives when they go on operations. Yeah. This and the survival skills they've already been taught. Get your little fucking snack pack out or whatever. If you've got one hit at making this fire, you want to make sure it works, don't you? What else do we have in our survival tin? A bit of cotton wool, all right? Yeah. Frontline commandos carry the most unexpected survival aids. What we're going to do is we're going to rip open the old tampon itself. OK, these can be a bit, a bit troublesome to get open. However, a bit of brute force tends to do the trick. See how much cotton wool's coming out of this? Everyone happy with that? That's why we carry them, lads. The bits of kit. OK, what we've got is, is the old uh, Swedish fire still. OK, it's got 12,000 strikes in it. Obviously, now it's just a question of getting the cotton wool to catch. And it's purely just an upwards motion. Huh. There you go, you've got fire. <laughs> Obviously, now we've got our fire, we're going to start doing the old cooking from it. We're going to start boiling water, aren't we? We're going to start getting our clothes in and around it. It's one of the integral parts of survival. Check pace, or how far have we done? We've done eight and a half hundred metres. in between? 850 metres. Yep, it's a fair fucking guess. All right, as you can see. It's hard, isn't it? Keeping pace. It's hard, it's having to adjust it to the... And maintaining direction. Yeah, you're going up, you're going down, you're going through heavy vegetation. It's not going to be 100%, <coughs> but you're going to be there or thereabouts. Rather Commandos must be completely self-sufficient, carrying everything they need to survive and, of course, to fight the enemy. Also essential in a battle zone is the ability to move over rough ground carrying heavy loads of 100 pounds or more. Marines are famously expert at this. They call it... Yomping. Get a move on, fellas. It's just a marine skill, and we prove it time and time again. The Falklands, 90 miles in three days, carrying all their kit and equipment. And the, the Argentinians, on their battle plan, ruled out that angle of attack because they said no one could get from there to there. There's no, no physical way of doing it. Cue, you know, 
unit of Marines over the, uh, over the hill, having yumped 90 miles in three days. And people say, oh, there's no point now, you've got helicopters, you've got transport, but sure as eggs are eggs, helicopters will go down, transport breaks, gets reallocated, and the only way is a Mark 1 leather personnel carrier from A to B. So that's why I do it. Right, fellas, get a move on. Why is this section lagging behind far more than the other sections? Is it a bit of balls, a bit of grit and determination, yeah? Part of our tradition in the Corps that we yomp places with our kit and equipment. The rest of the troop, about half a kilometre in front of us now, pick up the pace, fellas. The, the way I always say to people when I'm showing them about survival shelters and that, you don't see natives in any sort of country living in fucking lean twos. You do see people living in these, yeah? The Native Americans have lived in wigwams for thousands of years because they're fucking good bits of kit. The survival techniques they're taught have been perfected in the field by the always anonymous special forces. Would the smoke not give you a position or anything? Yes, it might. What you've got to remember here, lads, is this is you out in the middle of fucking nowhere. You're in a hostile country, but it's fucking a remote part of that country. In that case, the decision's yours if you're going to have a fire. If I was in Iraq and I got fucking left in the shit, I wouldn't fucking light anything, not even a cigarette. Mm. Round this way, then. That is your fucking tactical survival <laughs> shelter when these people oh. fucking want to kill you. How do you piss that stuff? That is a shell scrape that you could dig with your hands. Any sort of recess in the ground, if it's just a little fucking dent in the ground, that you could put some sort of roof over flat so that people walking past, that looks flat, doesn't it? And all you do is get in there in the daytime, you lie there, and you're just fucking shit by the side of you, you're pissed by the side of you. Whatever you're eating is scraps that other people have fucking left, or it's the old dead fucking rat that's on the floor. You're on the bones of your ass. Once it's dark, you fucking crawl out of it, you fuck off, and you do your night yomp. And the big thing you need to take away from fucking training, fellas, is if you get picked up, forget all the war films you've seen where you get put in a POW camp, they fucking don't happen anymore. You get locked up in someone's fucking house, in their fucking basement, you spend a few weeks getting fucking videoed, and then you get your fucking head cut off. If people we fight are not interested in taking prisoners, if you get caught, you are fucking going to die. Everyone happy with that? Commandos are trained to deal with any conditions, any weathers, and most of them can be found on Dartmoor. Oh, yep. Struggling a bit. Struggling a bit? You can't see anything. There's nothing around. There's nothing to... There's nothing to go off. And our distance has told us we should be here now. Right then, what I want everyone to do now, have a look at the way the land has gone and the land that we've covered. See where you think you are. Okay, who's uh, check navigation? After three days on the moor, with virtually no sleep, the recruits now have to do their first night navigation by themselves. Aiming for checkpoints manned by the training team, five patrols yomp into the freezing darkness. Essentially, this is the first time they're yomping on their, on their Todd on their own right. uh, around Dartmoor. So I'm just counting them out now. But if they do make mistakes, well, they're on their own this time. And they've right. got to work out what to do and how to get around it and get to the next checkpoint. Whatever you do, stay stay up the arse of the person in front of you because we're going to get this proper coming yeah, in. Ready, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. We're moving. Oh. You're right. You're right. It's pitch black and the recruits can see virtually nothing. Oh. Do you do, Adam? Fucking just jumped off that gate and landed right on the corner of that stone. To look at their maps, they use a torch shone through the top of a thumb. Any further illumination would be tactically unsafe. Shit, this is going to get shitty. Absolutely free. Coal and I'll tell it's the coldest stuff I've ever been. There's this. <laughs> my shoe is eating into my ear. My shoulders are absolutely killing me. I feel like if I lift another bag and put it on my back, I'm going to fall <coughs> to my knees. But every time I just put it on and just go. Yeah. Just go and go. Feet are killing me. Toes are really bad. It makes you walk funny and makes you slow down. And when you slow down and walk funny, you cause more injuries and it's just a downward spiral of events. Yeah. <sighs> but I still smile. <laughs> put you on that? Yeah, no, no, I've got that way. Yeah, me too. We've got to stick on the bearing. Yeah. All right, all right, I'm going to double check it. I don't want to get fucking lost now. No. Hmm. Fun and games. <laughs> After five hours, some of it being lost in a thickening night fog, the section make it back just before one o'clock, the cut-off time. Oh, now it's all about getting warm. 
I'm a tropical man, no use staying cold. <laughs> Nearly two hours after the cut-off time, ten men are still out on the moor. The training team, back from the moor themselves, are starting to worry. I know as soon as it comes to fast light and that clag lifts, we'll find it. Oh, it probably will do, but like the boss says, we can't take on. If somebody's injured up there now, we can't afford to leave them until the first lights are fired. Yeah. Right now, these lads have had no sleep and they are pretty much walking zombies, but I'm going to tell them to dig deep within themselves and find their oppos on Dartmoor. If I was lost in the middle of Dartmoor and I'd broken my leg, I'd like to think that my buddies were coming, regardless if they were tired, cold, hungry and had no sleep at all. I'd like to think in the back of my mind, yep, yeah, someone will come for me. I have every faith in their ability and they will come and they will find me. My fellas look in, everyone's eyes on me. Look into me. Obviously, uh, the other two uh, fire teams haven't made it back yet, which means they are somewhere out on Dartmoor. So we've got a plan for the worst case scenario, that they're fucking falling down a hole and they're injured and they can't get back here. So as a result, what we're going to do we're going to head out and we're going to sweep um, through the area that we just worked on with our headlights, with our head torches on, uh, whistles blowing, an extended line. And fingers crossed, we will find them. With ten recruits missing, what was an exercise is now a genuine search and rescue operation. Yeah, but we need to get our friends though. Yeah, mate, we need to get our friends. It must be dying, it must be cold, it must be freezing. Dead bottom. Oh, mate, we need to find them quickly. In the last 10 years, 30 people have died on Dartmoor. Three have been One, Marines. Two, three. Nine, two, four, three! Oh, that was gas, lads. My missus could shout over. What were we that. shouting? Oh, oh, fuck me, where are they? You've got all these fucking flares going up and you've got all those shouting, trying to light torches. 94 Troop have gone almost 72 hours without sleep and next to no food. Now, on a mission to find their friends, they are indeed at the limits of their endurance, but must keep searching for as long as it takes. You fought, tell the chief commander you're sick, lame and weary. The following morning, and still no sign of the lost patrol. Now, at first light, they're heading out again. But only those who are not too exhausted. I can't afford to take people that are going to become liabilities. No, no, it's not me. I'm coming. Good. I'm coming. One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, he is what I'm coming. The nice thing he's talking to the guys here. The camaraderie's started now. We won't be leaving them behind, will we, Corporal? Which is a good thing, because obviously yeah, we do pride ourselves on not leaving anybody behind. Sure enough, water's moving. After an hour of searching, Terry thinks he's seen a movement, but can't be sure. Dot. Right, there's a dot right on the edge of the like bushy path. I want you to walk with us in a line, but keep an eye on that, all right? Yes, Corporal. The patrol heads towards the movement Terry thought he saw. And sure enough, they soon see figures on the horizon. But it could just be other searchers. Keep them sweeping for the time being, just in case it's another unit. <laughs> Close in! It'd be nice if there's ten. It's them. The Lost Patrol. Hope you had a good night's sleep. We've been up all night. Everybody all right? It's an ankle. Today, his ankle. But everyone's still... You've got two syndicates, yeah? Go on, go on. The Lost Patrol had decided, once they realised that they were lost, to bed down for the night. They put up their bivouacs, got in their warm sleeping bags and had a restful night's sleep. Three o'clock in the morning, that was like Blackpool Illuminations. Quite oblivious that their friends were up all night looking for them. Yep, tired now. <laughs> After I found them, started to kick in now, so I'm tired now. Williams was in tears, he was. He's been crying all night. <laughs> but he's OK, mate. <laughs> huh? He's smiling again now. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> what you do? Two Sleep out? Two night survival <laughs> eggs. <laughs> we return to base, where everybody wants to welcome back the Lost Patrol. Royal Marine style. Good effort, fellas. Nice bit of controlled aggression. Don't get the anger, get the best of you. <laughs> tap out your aegis, you're going to die. <laughs> One section, never <laughs> tap out, boss. <laughs> She's broken, so she can't. She can barely walk. <laughs> She's all got a guy on the back as well. Too much yomping, huh? 
It's just exhaustion and my feet are just wrecked. These boots are shit. If we have to yomp, Jesus. It's about 7.85 kilometres to our objective. Let's get there ASAP. After all they've been through, the exhausted recruits must still complete their exercise. First, another agonising yomp carrying 100 pound loads. Get a move on, fellas. And at no time are they left with any illusion that this is just a game. Hey, fellas, imagine, yeah, you're in a survival situation. Your troop house has just been blown to fucking smithereens by the Taliban. On the run somewhere, and you're absolutely exhausted. You haven't slept for a day, two days, three days. You are going to be absolutely hooplard. That's when you need to summon your inner strength to work out even which way's north and what the hell is going on. It's a bit of a taster there for you of how exhausted you may well be one day when you're on operations, OK? One night's sleep you didn't get there. My fellas, one straight line. This mate. It's good now as well to transfer with literally no sleep throughout the night straight into a survival exercise. The situation they're in now, so they're literally fully exhausted, have you seen? You know, I dare say most of them won't have had this lack of sleep ever in their lives. So and also teach them you can sleep anywhere, back of a car seat, taxi rank, four tonner, coach, plane, whatever. The skill that boot next to you quite well. They've come together as a team and they've hunted for their oppos who were lost on Dartmoor. I think that in itself has brought them together. They've never done anything that hard, but now at the end of it they can look back and go, actually, I could do that again, you know? It's made them stronger. They wouldn't realise it yet. When they're out in Afghanistan in the middle of nowhere and they're going to yomp 20k after having no sleep, they'll be like, yep, I can do that. I've done it before and I will do it. It's that inner confidence in themselves. They know they've done it and they can do it again. The recruits, dead to the world, have but a few minutes respite before they'll be woken with an unexpected and somewhat brutal challenge. The exhausted recruits must now prepare to spend one more night living rough, with nothing more than the clothes they stand up in and only very limited rations. Just going to basically check them, make sure they've got no uh, contraband, Mars bars, cigarettes. No. I can then check all the clothing. They're uh, quite sneaky at times, the way they try and hide things. Pants down, turn around. Yeah. But at least they've been promised a meal to remember. Hello there. Who's going to be eating you tonight, eh? You're going to be cooked up. Yum, yum, yum. Rabbit in my tum, tum, tum. Eight rabbits and eight chickens will be on the menu tonight. But the recruits will be doing the cooking and the killing. Ah, you going to get your neck broken. Uh, look at him. See, look, someone's already tried eating him. He's got half his ear missing. Give it a kiss. I'm hungry right now, honestly, Chris. I have no problem killing anything, no matter how big it is. I'll run it down and kill it. It's sad taking their lives, but someone's got to die for someone to live. It's a dog-eat-dog war. Only the strongest will live. I'm going to rip that rabbit to shreds tonight. I'm hungry. <laughs> I don't even want to touch him. Oh, I don't want to kill it. It's because it'll bloody fluffy. <laughs> I'm making a hat out of mine. A pair of slippers because my feet are in bits. <laughs> right, welcome to probably the most enjoyable part of the training. Obviously, the, the killing side of it. Uh, we're going to show you how to kill a rabbit and a chicken, skin it, gut it. Well, the first thing we need to do is relax the animal, all right? The way we'd simply do it is just grab the legs and swing it backwards and forwards. The way we're going to kill it then is the stick goes around the back of the head. You place either feet each side of the head, simply pull up. Lay her down either side and off we go, all right? And obviously, this is, if I let it go now, this is where the term the headless chicken comes from. All right, say hello to Susie. Hey, Susie. All right. All that happening is there is the nervous system kicking With in. commandos, yeah. there's always a gallows humour to take the edge off a moment. You can have a bit of fun if you want. Get the old finger puppet. You've got two, you can have Punch and Judy shows. Keep you occupied for the night. We've killed it. What we need to do now is start taking the pelt off. It's got a pelt and then the skin. Simply make an incision so you can get your fingers in, once you get your hand in. Commandos, perhaps on the run behind enemy lines, must know how to kill animals as a matter of basic survival. And not only for food. Try and keep the pelt intact. You can use it for insulation, i.e. your hat, socks, whatever. And then the pelt just simply comes off. All you simply do then is dry that out in the sun, half an hour or so, and that'll be good to go, ready to use what you want. And here we have... Tesco's finest. What we need to do now is get the insides out. Scoop it all out with your fingers. All right, don't be beef. Get right amongst it. Well, you don't waste hardly anything of an animal, right? 
What is that? Yellow things. Yeah, yolk of eggs. So obviously a good source of uh, protein there. So what do you reckon we could use all this for? Bait. Yep, use it as bait for obviously larger animals. You dry it out, that'll make brilliant cordage. So you can sort of make shelters, traps and what have you. All right, my daughter is absolutely threaded with me tonight. <laughs> all right, when she goes home and finds her rabbits flaming. You simply place the, the rabbit over your leg. Nice firm strokes all the way from the arse to the um, ears. The way we kill it is simply a kung fu chop, hold it up in the air and you're hitting it right there, back of the spine. One chop should kill it. And as you can see there, dead, but just making sure. What's good water source from an animal? Yep, the eyeballs, 80% water. That could keep you going for half a day or whatever. Pull the eyelid back as far as it possibly will go. Put your teeth behind the eyeball. Suck real hard, you feel it pop. Don't chew it. All right, just swallow it. What you're going to get is an animal between two people. All right, nurse it like it's your girlfriend, all right? Make it feel at home. Give them a kiss if they want a kiss. Lovely. Bet you'd like some grass, wouldn't you? Yeah. All right, start finding a branch straight away for your chickens. Start stroking your um, rabbits, all right? All right, start getting the rabbits on your knees. Over the back of the head. Over the back of the head. Feet either sides, keeping hold of the legs, and just oh, yank it up. Keep stroking all the way down. It's all right, I've got his attention now. Give him the good news. Go on. It felt really like. I didn't even know the feeling, actually. I'm holding it. That's all I'm thinking of. Bit of grub, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking starving. I want to settle down, I want to get cooking, I want to make shelter, I want to chill out, I want to get back tomorrow. Because my feet are hanging out. I don't give a fuck really for this chicken. <laughs> Jesus. Right, once you're done then, make your way to the top. The recruits, having killed, skinned and gutted their supper, now report to their instructors with their handiwork. The key thing, of course, is minimum wastage. Right, some of you might think this isn't important, all right? Believe you me, when you're in a survival situation for real, and you're out there for 10 fucking days, every single bit of meat is gonna be essential to your survival, all right? A full lungs and heart just slung in the blooming gash bag. What did I say? Eat it. Is that yours? Right, and a kidney. All right, it's tiny, but it keeps you going for maybe an hour or so. Just a little bit of protein like that. Small points, but this, is that acceptable? No problem. Right. How much meat is on that? Loads. Right, loads. Everyone's telling me that, so why have you decided to gash? Just couldn't be bothered and it was lazy. Right down by the side. You have been taking the piss out of me by fucking throwing stuff away. I'm not happy with that. So we're going to play a little game called Times Two Minutes. Behind the lines in Afghanistan, you can bet there would be no wastage. But here in Devon, a little extra encouragement is needed to swallow the lung and heart of a freshly killed chicken. Squat, and squat. Back on. We don't come here and kill animals for the sake of it. We come here to teach you to become Royal Marine Commandos. Punishment taken. The recruits have to make their shelters, build their fires, and prepare to spend their last night living rough. The week's nearly done. Shit exercises out of the way. Was it shit, was it? No, I meant hard. It wasn't shit. It wasn't shit. I, I enjoyed it. I learned an awful lot as well. The night now was brilliant. But it's hard, it's hard work. Not the best. It's all right. We did it all right. You've got to make fires, learn how to use lots of weapons, go to range, do loads of fizz. After a week of extreme challenges, it is, ironically, the one thing that went wrong, losing a patrol one bleak night on the moors, that seems to have taught the recruits their most important lesson. Well, I was thinking, fuck me, I'm knackered, me, I've done this. And I looked at everyone and I thought, they fucking done it as well. They're day knackered as well. Yeah. It's the same. So I'm thinking, well, that doesn't make me any different. I know he can do what I can do, and I can do what he can do. 
and it, it, it does. You just learn to respect everyone, really. You, you have to be one in order to go forward, or else we won't go forward. We have to like, you know, try and get to know each other the best way we can. I'm, I don't know if if I if I hadn't joined this, what I might walk down the road and smacks me up, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't think dream. about it. I wouldn't <laughs> think about it. In your dreams. We've all like done the same shit, so we have a bit more respect for each other. I mean, if we do go out to Afghanistan, can't wait to get out. Oh, out to Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I really want to go out there. Yeah. But it's just yeah, obviously, yeah. obviously, I'm saying I can't wait to get out there now. No but serious thing. When it turns to reality, it will be. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Just knowing that you've left all your family out behind for the last time you see them. It must be fucking horrible for the lads that are. That's the thing, isn't it? You can have all the training in the world, but there's only one thing that will prepare you for that, and that's going out there. Is that the first time you killed anything? Me? Yeah. No, 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 first time I've done something like that. Yeah. Went to bed. Get up there! Next time on Commando, it's make or break for Terry John on a speed march that he must pass. Crew John, get up there. I've just seen you run. And we meet Bertie Carr, the young officer in training, who will eventually lead the recruits who make it to Afghanistan. Run it off! Run it off! Run it off!